The Vancouver Canucks make a significant move to their organization by promoting the Sedins to a higher role. Jim Rutherford speaks out on this, on the Sedins, and how they helped one player develop to its next level. We'll get into that later on this episode. Before we start, I just want to give a huge shout out to the 4106 of you guys. I know you guys are sick of me saying it, but we're trying to reach 4500 by next Sunday. So make sure to go down and hit that subscribe button. We'll be all off season in the next season, giving you updates from around the Canucks. But with that, let's hop straight into the first topic today, which is Sedin's to be more involved. Now, everyone that's watching this knows Henrik Sedin and they know Daniel Sedin. And Jim Rutherford went on to a show today and spoke out on both of them. The Sedins, they've been so good for us what they've done because they quietly just help a lot of players but you're going to see that they will be more involved than they have been in the past. They'll be more involved in helping with that power play. Now the biggest thing is we've seen the Canucks have a decent power play in the middle of the regular season last year and it really felt like it dried up going into the playoffs but just looking at the Canucks power play they were ranked 12th in the NHL with a 22.6% on the power play, just behind teams like the Kings, the Wild, Red Wings, Panthers, Maple Leafs, and Stars. But getting Henrik and Daniel Sidney more involved into this power play will cause a big momentum shift for this team. I mean, watching Henrik and Daniel in their primes playing on this Canucks power play, if they can put any bit of that mojo into this current team, we're going to see a big change. But Griffin, what's your initial thoughts on just Henrik and Daniel coming in being more aggressive on this power play and really putting their touch on it. I love that they're just stepping into a more significant role. This is something that definitely fans wanted and expected, especially after the rumors came out and the announcements came out earlier in the off season too, that they would be moved into a higher position. We had a feeling that it was going to be on the power play and this confirms it for sure. That power play, it's was the, not too bad in the regular season ranking 12th, but they were behind teams that didn't even make the playoffs. So by the postseason, they were probably 16th in the postseason as far as getting the power play going. It felt very irrelevant and insignificant to them in the postseason. And in the regular season, it did cost them in a lot of games as well as giving up shorthanded goals. So the power play and the penalty kill is definitely something that they're going to have to work on. And I don't doubt that the Sedins are going to refine all the tools in their arsenal to make sure that Vancouver goes into next season not having to worry about that at all, and especially in the postseason as well. Because we've seen almost at the end of the year, there's videos surfacing of Tockett, both Sedins, and Foot working on the power play as a unit themselves just to show the other players on how to continue developing. But the biggest thing, Griffin, just looking at from daily faceoffs, the current projections on the first power play unit, is there anything you'd like to see change, or do you think this is the ideal unit? I would love to see to go to Joshua out there. It is amazing to see Bresser, Miller, and Pedersen united on that power play unit. We've been talking about the lotto line in the past. But if you're going to have Carter Garland out there, you have to have Batman with Robin as well. And that would be Dakota Joshua. It would be nice. That he doesn't belong in front of the net. He is more of an up front forward. But because Vancouver is so stacked at forward, it almost feels like you need a third power play unit or a special power play unit just to fit him in there. Because when he's on the ice, great things happen. And he's one of those big body wingers who can score and can hit as well. Yeah, because the biggest thing is, and you're going to start noticing a trend just when we hop into the second unit, but it feels like, like you said, the Canucks need a third unit with how much power they have from their forwards, from their defensemen, and just looking into the second unit. I think this unit is nice, and I do agree, getting Dakota Joshua would be nice. We've seen him into the playoffs score two goals on the power play to kind of break their dry spell, but bringing in a guy like Daniel Sprung, Jake DeBrusque, who are going to be great offensively. We've seen Jake DeBrusque score 30 goals. We've seen Daniel Sprong basically have back-to-back -back 20 goal seasons having these guys on the power play on the second unit so the first unit doesn't have to play as much as maybe they wanted to from last season but having the second unit to really put in work on teams when their penalty killers start getting tired might be the ideal situation and if you had to replace someone on the second unit Griffin who would you move out to put Dakota Joshua there? Uh, on the second unit, I might move Jake DeBrusque and find a way to fit him into that first unit just because Joshua, you don't want to put him in the back end and Sprong can make great things happen. I think DeBrusque would play better with Petey than he would with any of these other line mates. So maybe you find a way to fit Joshua in there. I don't know exactly how just because he is someone you want in front of the net. 
but getting DeBrusque in there and putting Garland in there to swap with, maybe with Sprong as well to jumpstart that new line as well. Maybe he brings them together and jumpstarts PD as well on that line. So maybe make a mix up there. But as long as you have Garland and Joshua on the ice together, I think that's when great things are going to happen. And they did bring in those difference makers with DeBrusque and Sprong that could make that happen as well. And the crazy thing is we could see so much changes. I mean, looking at the second unit, maybe we see Daniel Sprong jump up onto the top unit. Yes, it's probably a little premature of me to say, but Daniel Sprong's an offensive winger that can really pot you goals. And it's going to be interesting how Rick Tockett really uses these lines, utilizes these players. But it didn't stop there when Jim was speaking on the Sedins. He continued on to say their titles aren't assistant coaches. They're still on the development side because they like to go to work in Absurd with the guys there, and they've been really good at times, but yeah, they're fi uh, effectively will be a part of Rick's staff. So seeing Bo Sedin's not going on to the coaching staff, but basically being on to the coaching staff is pretty good to see. Jim also spoke out and saying how Daniel and Hendrick Sedin were willing to put the city in front of them in every matter, how much they love the city, how much they uh, just kind of bleed for the city so having these guys being a major part of this is going to be quite awesome what are your guys thoughts on Henrik and Daniel Sandin kind of coming in and taking over the power play what kind of changes and how do you feel about the lines we talked about but we'll get straight into the second topic today which is Hoaglander benefit from mentoring now it does continue on where Jim spoke on Hoaglander and how the Sedins worked with him he said Hoaglander last year he played a lot he had a lot to learn coming in. He was scoring some goals, scoring some nice goals, but he had some things to learn on the defensive side of the puck. They took him as a project, and within the matter of two months, some of those bad habits he had early on in the season, he got rid of. And this continued on to him scoring 24 goals, 12 assists for 36 points in 80 games. We've seen him light up in the bottom six, getting all the way to promote it into the top six. Just at 23, Hoaglander has so much room to move. This guy has top six winger written all over him. I think there's no doubt he plays in the middle six as early as next season and stays there within the year. But Griffin, what's your thoughts on Hoaglander's development? What's your thoughts on the Sedins kind of just taking them under the wing and just working with them on every aspect of their game? It's nice that he has been taking the mentorship of two all-time Canucks greats who have brought great history and great times to this city and this organization. So it's great that they view him as a project that they can work and mold into almost like their own image or a hybrid of how they used to play, but in one player. Hoaglander has continued to develop greatly throughout his development with Vancouver. I think last season you saw with great things happening, that plus 23 rating is really a sneaky stat where great things were happening when he was on the ice, and he was only on the ice for an average of 12, points, uh, 12 minutes and 6 seconds, which means that he was making things happen on the ice in a short amount of time. In a place where Vancouver had a lot of guys making a lot of things happen, he made an impact in a short amount of time when it mattered most. And I think that's something that Vancouver is going to carry into next season, especially with these new weapons that he has to play with. And like you said many times before, how front-loaded they are with the forward positions, I think Vancouver is going to be in great shape, especially with Hoaglander developing so well. And the funny thing is, is you bring up the 12 minutes time on ice. When looking at Daniel Sprung, he scored 21 goals in roughly the same time on ice. So having two guys that can score your goals, obviously Hoaglander is going to be better defensively, but having two guys that can score your 20 goals, bounce around this lineup is going to be a big impact. And I kind of see Sprung coming in, playing in this bottom six and having just kind of the same impact of scoring 20 goals on either the fourth or third line. But what are you guys' thoughts on Daniel and Hendrick Sedin kind of just taking Hoaglander under the wing? Is there anyone on this team, obviously like Ramaki is the obvious answer for me at least, but who would you guys like to see them take under their wing next and kind of work on their game? Let us know down in the comments, but speaking on comments, we'll get everyone's favorite topic, which is comments of the day. The comment today comes from Air Drifter, and they say, you know it's going to be banger video when the New Balance hat takes a walk and we get the retro nucks. And you know what? i see seen this comment. Had you use it and a retro nux is back do you know what maybe i'll keep this for the next 30 days no switching just straight retro nux but if you guys enjoy this and you want to leave a comment on anything we talked about or what hat you want to see me wear let us know down in the comments you could be featured on the next episode of comments today like air drifter did today while you're down there leave a like subscribe share this with your friends we'll be back tomorrow with another episode i've been your host mark Potter with my co-host griffin take care